um, so today in this short talk, I'm going to talk about tracking 12 years of genetic architecture estimates of schizophrenia. So my target audience for this talk are really analysts from the PGC. Um, the work I'm talking about comes from is part of the latest PGC schizophrenia uh, paper, which is currently on Med Archive. And the work I'm talking about is particularly uh, working with Vassa and Mick as we drill down into some results. And uh, the results are found in the main text section, SNP-based heritability and polygenic prediction, and also a supplementary note. So my motivation was really that schizophrenia is one of the flagship disorders for the PGC. Um, often because the sample sizes are larger for, uh, earlier on, some of the things that we do and see um, uh, are later seen by other disorders. So uh, 12 years of tracking. So I'm considering the papers that started in 2009 with the International Schizophrenia Consortium paper, which, had, uh, which was the first large genome-wide association study for schizophrenia of 3,000 cases. We then had the PGC wave one in 2011, 9,000 cases, PGC two uh, wave two in 2014 with 37,000 cases, and the latest wave three with 69,000 cases. So this graph is just uh, illustrating how uh, the uh, discovery over those publications with on the X axis number of cases and on the Y axis the number of independent, the associated uh, loci going from actually zero from the uh, uh, 2009 paper to now nearly 250 with the wave three. So before I start, I'm going to, to just give some basic concepts. So with this uh, bar, I'm representing uh, the variation from all factors that, that contribute to um, a, a trait, in this case, risk of a disorder, risk of schizophrenia. This bar represents the variation attributable to genetic factors, and the ratio between these two is then the heritability. And we estimate this from uh, family data. This bar represents the uh, variance that's attributable to genetic factors which attract on our uh, common variant genotyping array, so in our GWAS data sets. So obviously uh, our GWAS arrays don't track all variants, just some of them. And so the variation that's uh, associated with them is, is smaller than the total genetic variance. And so this ratio, the ratio between this one and this one is the, then the SNP-based heritability, which is less than the heritability. And then this bar represents the variation that's explained in out of sample prediction in polygenic risk prediction. And for that, we use uh, the R squared term. So our expectation is that as uh, this value is less than the SNP-based heritability, but as sample sizes increase, this value will get closer to this one. Just a small word about R squared. Um, we're used to the term R squared variance explained by a regression um, when we think about linear regression, when we have a binary trait, it's a little bit more complicated. And so we have this statistic, the Nargle curve as R squared. One of the problems with this statistic is that uh, it actually uh, depends on the proportion of cases in the sample. So in this graph, I'm showing all, all the line, all the points on these lines explain the same variance in liability but um, the actual estimate of the Nargle curve depends on the proportion of cases in the sample. So back to 2009, in this very first paper, this was the first paper we, where we actually made estimates of what we now call SNP-based heritability, and the first paper where we looked at out-of-sample prediction. So this was the iconic figure from that paper. On the y-axis, it was the Nargle Kirkus R squared, we're predicting from the International Schizophrenia Consortium into other independent samples. Here, another European sample called the MGS sample. And the different color bars uh, reflect that we were using the basic p-value uh, clumping and thresholding method um, uh, with the different thresholds for, for the p-values. So in this talk, I'm not explaining polygenic risk prediction. I'm assuming everybody knows what it is. And if you don't, there's another PGC talk or several talks which are about specifically about polygenic risk prediction. So in this paper, we asked two questions. We said, what genetic architecture is consistent with the observations that we, we, we saw? And 
how do we expect the out of sample prediction to change as sample size increases? So many of you might have heard me say before that my favorite figure in this paper is this supplementary uh, figure eight. So on the y-axis, we have the novel purpose R squared, and on the x-axis, we have sample sizes, and these are results from simulations. So we considered um, a sample size of 3,000 cases with 3,000 controls, and we chose that to mimic the real data. And then we thought about increasing sample sizes going up to 20,000 cases and 20,000 controls. Back in 2009, we thought it was uh, absolutely ridiculous to think about going to larger sample sizes. We even thought they'd be laughed at for going to 20,000 cases. But of course, 12 years on, we're now three times that size. So um, the different colored bars are again, the different p-value thresholds and the different uh, graphs represent different genetic architecture models. So those gen genetic architecture models differed in the number of causal variants, the uh, frequency of the uh, alleles of the causal variants and the effect sizes. And what we found was that we could model many different ge genetic architectures, which are really very different in terms of the number, number of causal variants. Um, but each of them generated observations which would very be similar to what we actually saw in, in real life. And but we uh, predicted that as sample sizes increases, we might see differences in the uh, in in the shape of uh, the p-value thresholding results depending on genetic architectures. But you can see we went up to an overall Kirkus R squares of you know like 20 20 percent. So what do we expect with increasing sample size? First of all, for SNP-based heritability. So um, we have to have some caveats for making comparisons as in sample sizes increase. First of all, we have to make sure that we're thinking about the same definition of phenotype. We need to have our samples drawn from the same ancestry. We need to be using the same SNP set um, for these comparisons and the same method to estimate the SNP-based heritability. There are some other third order assumptions which we don't need to worry about. But basically, our basic expectation is that with increasing sample size, we expect that the estimate of the SNP-based heritability uh, to not change with sample size because we expect it to be an unbiased estimate, whatever the sample size. Of course, sample size comes into the standard error, so we expect as sample sizes increase, the standard errors will get smaller. And so uh, the estimates might bounce around as sample size increase, but only in, with respect to the standard error. So what do we actually see? So here um, on the y-axis, I've got the estimate of SNP-based heritability on the liability scale. On the x-axis, the different uh, sample sizes. So this is that uh, first International Schizophrenia Consortium sample of 3,000 cases. And this was the estimate we made from a simulation of 0.34. We were then able to directly go in and, and estimate uh, from individual level data um, using the GREML method, and then our estimate was 0.27 with this 95% confidence interval. Um, we then went to the wave one data, and then the estimate was 0.23, with, uh, which was not statistically different. We did observe, though, that um, when we made those estimates, we made them separately for the ISC sample, the MGS sample, and the other cohorts um, and those estimates individually were all um, larger than the overall estimate. So we had 0 0.27, 0 0.31, 0 0.27, but when we put them together, it was 0.23. So what was going on there? Well, it, this could be that some of those assumptions I had on the previous slide weren't upheld. So for example, um, maybe a slightly different phenotype definition, not quite sampled from the same population, et cetera. So these are the estimates then from uh, wave two and wave three. Again, not statistically significant. Uh, this says 69K, but it's actually just from the European subset. Uh, I've got a comparison here with a methodology comparison. Um, so these ones were by G. Remmel. When we get to the larger waves, we didn't have access to all the individual level data. So uh, the estimates are then based on summary statistics. We can use LD score regression, which is perhaps more commonly used, but we know from many simulation studies that LD score regression actually gives slightly biased estimates. It slightly underestimates the true SNP-based heritability, uh, but the estimates using uh, 
uh, more modern methods such as S phase S are less biased. And so this is now our best estimate of SNP based heritability 0.24. But basically, the estimates haven't really changed um, with increasing sample size as we would expect. So what do we expect with increasing sample size for out of sample prediction? Well, first of all, we again, we have to make comparisons like with like. So we, you know, some of the same assumptions as for the SNP based heritability also hold for the, the GWAS discovery sample, which makes our, SNP, uh, our polygenic prediction. But then we also have some additional some assumptions uh, for the target sample. So we need to be comparing based on the same method to generate the polygenic risk score. We need to be using the same kind of SNP QC, which maybe is also part of the methodology. And uh, to have an apples and apples comparison, we need to be using the same te test cohort. So under these conditions, what do we expect? We expect that the out of sample prediction statistic will increase as the sample size of the discovery sample increases. And we're going to have a maximum, uh, and we know that there's a maximum of that uh, R squared statistic, which is the SNP based heritability. So the sample size of the target sample comes in not to um, the estimate, but to the, the standard error. So the key thing is the sample size of the discovery sample, the outer sample prediction R square goes up, the sample size of the target sample affects the standard error of the estimate. So these are the results from the wave three study. Uh, this is a, a figure that's in the paper that's on Med Archive. So on the Y axis here, we've got uh, the R squared on the liability scale. On the X axis, we've got those different p-value thresholds, again, using the basic p-value uh, clumping and thresholding method. Um, in wave three, we have cohorts of different ancestries. And so uh, these results show the leave one cohort out um, predictions. So we leave one cohort out, predict into it. So we have samples of different ancestries shown by the orange dots, which are uh, African-Americans going up to um, the green dots, which are the European cohort. So we can see we have better out of sample prediction in the European cohorts, not surprising given the majority of our discovery sample are also European. So we got the highest out of sample prediction for the p-value threshold of 0 0.05, um, and the median value across those cohorts was 7.3%. And so this talk was really uh, kind of motivated by this initial observation we had that this uh, outer sample prediction median across the cohorts was 7.3%, which for me sent up slight uh, flag warnings because I knew that from wave two, we had an outer sample prediction of 7%. And I felt that this increase from 7 to 7.3 was uh, not as much as I might have expected. So then we did a bit of digging. So what did we find? So this is now out of sample prediction comparing apples with apples going into a single cohort. This is now the MGS cohort. And here we're looking at the nargle kirkus R squared. And I've, I've done that because that was the statistic used in that first paper in 2009. So now we do see uh, when we're uh, comparing on a, a single cohort that uh, with sample sizes increasing, we do get a good increase in um, variance explained going from that 3% nargle kirkus R squared uh, in 2009 up to 6% when we had 9,000 cases, 18% um, for 37,000 cases and 21% uh, now. And this is then translating those estimates to the liability scale. So we're now at a point of 9.9% um, liability variance explained. And in fact, we know that if we use more advanced methods for generating the polygenic scores, this is now going uh, above 10%. Um, and the other, uh, thing that we looked at was again uh, thinking about like with like so on the previous slide i said that in the wave two when we had uh, the wave two discovery predicting into the left out uh, pgc uh, wave two cohorts that the uh, statistic of out of sample prediction median was seven percent uh, and i showed on the previous slide when we have the wave three predicting into the left out wave three cohorts that median was 7.3 percent which is not very uh, a big difference but we realized that if we take the PGC3 discovery and predict into the PGC2 cohorts, so now we're again a like with like uh, comparison, that's going up to 8.5%. So part of the, the low difference here was actually in the nature of those PGC3 cohorts. So that was all I wanted to show in this talk um, and hoping that it's uh, useful for analysts in other PGC disorders. 
So just left to give my acknowledgements, nothing I do goes without funding, so thank you for the funding. And particularly a shout out to uh, the PGC Schizophrenia Consortium and all the collaborators that make that happen. And particularly to Bassa, Mick and Jan who helped uh, provide, uh, you know, really investigate uh, what's presented in this talk. Thank you.